By 1963, Ray Harryhausen had been creating magic in the movies for at least 10 years. His previous two adventures were enjoyable, but flawed. The Three Worlds of Gulliver was high on imagination, but low on monsters, an essential element to any Harryhausen film. Mysterious Island was high on adventure, but low on story. If a balance could be got just right, who knows how great a film we could get. Q, Jason and the Argonauts. The story of Jason and his quest for the Golden Fleece has been told many times over the centuries, nay millennia. The earliest recognisable version of the tale dates back to the 3rd century BC and the epic poem Argonautica by Apollonius of Rhodes, although that was based on even older stories. Although the tale has always been popular, with countless retellings by a multitude of authors, it was slow to transition into other media, until 1963 at least. The only other film version I can find before then is an Italian film released in 1960 called Jason and the Golden Fleece, although its original title was... Uh, okay, I'll give it a go. I Giganti della Tessalia. That translates as The Giants of Thessaly, a title used again and again in foreign dubs. That title and the subsequent Golden Fleece one were chosen because it was assumed that most cinema-going audiences wouldn't be familiar with the term Argonaut. I think they were right, but things would soon change. Ray had grown up with a love of ancient Greek and Roman myths, and in the 1950s, he and regular producer Charles H. Schneer discussed adapting one for the big screen. All of the best-known legends were considered, but they settled on Jason and his quest because it offered the most potential adventure and fantasy elements. Naturally, the film was going to be titled Jason and the Golden Fleece, until they found out about that Italian flick. So a list of alternatives was drawn up, and the title that we are all familiar with was chosen. Ray was so much more than an animator. The films he worked on were often based around his story ideas, and indeed that was the case with Jason and the Argonauts. What, even though the myth already existed? Yes, because he changed many of the story elements to make it more suitable for a motion picture. He came up with a rough draft, and then screenwriter Beverly Cross rounded out the details. So it was that on June the 19th, 1963, this great film was released. Was it a hit? It did okay. It made a profit, but nothing spectacular. Maybe this was because it came out towards the end of the Italian sword and sandal era, and audiences were growing tired of that genre. Maybe those concerns about the word Argonaut were correct after all. Once again, it is thanks to our old friends at Dell Comics that we got the comic book adaptation of Ray's film, released a week after the source material. However, unlike its predecessors, this was not a part of Dell's four colour line. Instead, for reasons unknown, it was given its own one-shot movie special. As usual with Dell, there were no credits, but it was written by Paul S. Newman, the man who had adapted The Three Words of Gulliver, and drawn by John Tartaglioni although some sources had previously ascribed it to Morris Whitman. John was very much a Marvel man, inking numerous issues of their comics from the 60s up until the early 80s, and even beyond then, albeit sparingly. He provided pencils on a few early titles, such as Love Romances and My Secret Life. He also provided the art for Marvel's illustrated biographies of Pope John Paul II and Mother Teresa. He was actually working right up until his death from throat cancer in 2003, when he was in the process of inking some Spider-Man strips. The film was a classic. Was the comic book? This comic book adheres to the usual format for Dell, well, when it comes to adaptations of films anyway. And that means that on the inside of the front cover, we have a full black and white advert for the film itself. And remember, this was released whilst the film was still out in cinemas. So it makes perfect sense to include a full page advert for it. Actually, I suppose you could argue that this entire comic book is an advert for the film. The story here begins the same way that the film does, on a beach in ancient Greece. Here we meet the soon to be king of Thessaly, Pelias. He is asking for a prophecy, for a message from the gods to show him if he will be successful in his attack on Thessaly 
and how the future will unfold. He asks for one prophecy, but he gets two. Initially, he is told about a vision of a golden fleece hanging in a tree at the end of the world and a man wearing one sandal. But he isn't interested in that. He says, forget that. What about tonight? What about my attack on Thessaly? How will that go? And it's good news because his attack will be successful and he will wear the crown of the king of Thessaly. But there's more. Because it is also foretold that someday when Zeus decides it, he will lose the crown to one of the current king's children. Well, that's easily sorted. He'll just make sure that the king's two daughters and son are also killed that night. At this point, I've got to say, what a great likeness this is of the actor Douglas Wilmer. And it's not the only example of this in this comic book, as you will see. Then, somewhat disappointingly, we skip the big battle scene and join it right at the end, as we see that Pelias has spotted the king's eldest daughter running with a baby into the temple of Hera. Once inside the temple, she begins to pray to Hera, whilst Pelias sneaks up on her, knowing what needs to be done. He attacks her and indeed kills her. Now this is a Dell comic, so it doesn't really want to show uh, the daughter being murdered. But I can assure you that is exactly what happens, albeit off panel, because that is how it unfolds on the screen. As he dispatches the eldest daughter of the king, a mysterious woman tells him that the gods have abandoned him, and a one-sandaled man shall come, and no god will protect him from him. That one-sandaled man is the male child of the king, Jason. So he says, ah, so all I need to do is kill the young boy. But the mysterious woman says no. Zeus has decreed that Jason will succeed Pelias. If he tries to kill Jason, he will kill himself. That's a bit of a quandary, isn't it? Meanwhile, up on Mount Olympus, the gods are shocked by what Pelias has done. And in fact, Hera is offended because it happened in her temple. So Zeus says, that she can assist Jason six times, because that is the number of times that Jason's older sister asked Hera for help. Okay, well, in the film it was five, so it'll be interesting to see what the extra bit of help is. The first bit of help is already on its way, because as Pelias is riding beside a river, Hera, disguised as an old woman, startles his horse, causing him to be thrown into the river. Luckily for him, there is someone nearby to save him from drowning. But this isn't as fortunate for Pelias as he thought, because as he is recovering on the bank, he notices that his rescuer wears just one sandal. Not only that, but he is on his way to Thessaly. Now I'm sure at this point, Pelias would love to kill him, but of course that would mean his own doom. So he does the next best thing and invites him to a barbecue. At this event, Pelias' worst fears are confirmed, as he discovers that this is indeed Jason, son of the former king, who is on his way to avenge his father's death and reclaim his kingdom. And another good picture here, this time of the man who played Jason, Todd Armstrong. A man who was very upset to discover that his entire lines for the film were dubbed over by another actor. His own voice couldn't have been that bad, could it? Pelias, with his true identity still hidden from Jason, asks him what he would do if it was prophesied that a certain man would bring him disaster, but you would hasten that disaster if you killed him. Jason says that he would set him some task, far away, and one that would take so long to complete that he could never return to bring that disaster. He even suggests a suitable task, that being the recovery of the golden fleece that hangs in a tree at the end of the world. Something that may not even exist. Pelias' enemy could spend his entire life searching for that and never return. Pelias thinks that this is a brilliant idea. He orders his guards to seize Jason and he reveals his true identity. Hold on, that's totally different to the film. In the film, he never reveals his true identity to Jason 
And in fact, he suggests to Jason to go and find the fleece so he can then return to Thessaly and uh, the people will uh, gather, rally behind him with this great symbol, the golden fleece, and then he can overthrow the king. So they've changed that completely. Now you may be thinking, well, if I was Jason, I just wouldn't go on the quest then. Ah, ha, ha. they've got that covered. Because in another significant deviation from the film, Pelias reveals that for the last 20 years, he has held Jason's sister, the one who he last saw as a baby, as a prisoner. And she's there at the barbecue. If Jason doesn't undertake this quest, he will kill his sister. I don't even think she's mentioned again in the film after we see her in Hera's temple. Anyway, Jason of course agrees. And Pelias, just to tip the uh, balance in his favour, also uh, tells his son Acastus to accompany Jason on the quest and maybe claim the fleece uh, ahead of him. We are then shown that that guy who provided the prophecy at the beginning of the comic is actually the god Hermes. And revealing himself to Jason, he then takes him to Olympus to consult with the gods. Hera tells him that the golden fleece does indeed exist and it can be found in the land of Colchis. Yes, that is how it's pronounced. How will he get there? He will get the shipbuilders of Greece to build the finest ship ever and he will enlist the greatest Greek men as its crew. How will he identify these great men? They shall be selected from some athletic games. Now this is a well-known part of the film coming up. Oh, I do hope they make Hercules screen accurate as well. Ah, oh, he doesn't. He's just some generic beardy guy. Not only that, but he's quite well defined as well, unlike his screen counterpart. Now apparently that was an intentional decision because the producers wanted to get away from the overly muscular look that a lot of the leading men from those Italian sword and sandal films had. He still strikes up a friendship with the more intellectual Hylas though, as he does in the film, when Hylas outthinks him to win the discus. As Hercules' brute strength is outshone by Hylas's wits. And he also recruits Pelias' son, Acastus, after he wins the slinging competition, just as he did in the film. Yeah, but the big difference is in the film, he didn't know he was the son of his worst enemy. Oh well, I guess rules are rules, he did win the competition. And then the last part of his plan is in place as the shipwright Argus completes his job, providing a strong ship with a figurehead that overlooks the crew rather than overlooking the waters. I'm not sure they had figureheads at all, did they, on ancient Greek boats? Weren't they more into like massive eyes on the front of them? Anyway, this is no normal figurehead because it has been carved into the likeness of the goddess Hera. And once Jason is able to be alone with it, he consults with it. Now, Acastus has already made his presence felt by giving Jason some duff advice that would send him on a circuitous route and slow down their journey. So Jason asks the figurehead what route he should take. The figurehead tells him to head for the Isle of Bronze, where no mortal has ever set foot. But there are rules that the crew must abide by. Jason passes this on to the crew and they soon set sail. By noon, he says, they will be at the Isle of Bronze. They can take food and water, but nothing else. If they do, they will incur the wrath of Talos. During the voyage, he is asked, who is this man, Talos? But he says that he spoke of no man. If the crew disobeys his orders, they will all be punished. Just as they had been promised, they make landfall by noon, and the hungry and thirsty crew head inland to see what they can find. Hercules and Hylas go chasing after some goats that Hylas says will be useful not just for meat, but also for milk. But the goats don't want to be caught and a chase ensues. A chase that ends in a valley unlike any either of them have ever seen before. Now in the film, the first view of Talos is awesome. Not so much here, but don't worry, they do end up uh, doing the character justice because when he does come to life, that whole sequence lasts five pages. Pretty impressive. 
Now, as I'm sure you know, Hercules and Hylas find themselves in a treasure chamber. In that treasure chamber, they find the jewelry of the gods, a giant oversized golden brooch pin, huge pearls and many other riches besides. Now what happens next actually makes more sense here than it does in the film. Because in the film, as soon as they touch the treasures, they hear the sound of grinding metal. Here, nothing at all happens until Hercules says that he's going to take that golden brooch pin with him. And as soon as he says that, the door slams shut. Now usually, Dell weren't very creative with their page layouts. And fair enough, it was still the 1960s. They were big fans of the six panel page layout. But they've really gone for it uh, with this comic book. And in fact, the next page consists of just three panels, each one broad, landscape, and what panels they are. Because Talos descending from his plinth is just as intimidating here as it is in the film. Now his scale in the film does tend to be rather changeable, but he was never this big. Look at the size of him here. The crew sets sail hoping to escape, but it's hopeless. Just as was prophesied, the whole crew will suffer for Hercules' mistake. And soon enough, they find themselves emptied into the sea. On the subject of Talos, I've seen videos on YouTube where people have uh, upped the frame rate so that uh, Talos's movements are smoother. And they've done this with other Ray Harryhausen creations. And generally speaking, I can understand uh, the logic behind that. Although, of course, a lot of the uh, appeal of Ray Harryhausen's creations is how they moved. That is especially true of Talos. Yes, his movements were jerky, but that was intentional. Ray Harryhausen uh, has done interviews where he said that it was uh, quite a challenge for him to make Talos's movements more jerky compared uh, to his usual creations. So don't make those smoother because you're missing the point. Anyway, I think the crew were in the sea, weren't they? Indeed they were. And fortunately, Jason is bobbing about beside the figurehead of Hera. He asks her advice on how to defeat Talos. She says he needs to use his wits rather than his courage and look to Talos's ankles. She can tell him no more. As the crew scramble onto dry land, Hercules and Hylas join them and explain Hercules's mistake. Not far behind them is Talos. Acastus, in a rather antagonistic way, asks Jason what his worried captain is going to do now. Jason says he's gonna hide behind some rocks and that the rest of them should try to lure him to them. As they run off, Acastus says he will do his best to send Talos to Jason, his very best. Now he says the same thing in the film, but of course the difference there is that Jason doesn't know his true identity. So it's quite subtle and it just sounds like he's helping Jason. Here, things are different, and actually Jason has uh, a response uh, to what Acastus says. He says, save your venom for another day, Acastus. Too much is at stake now. How interesting that the same line from the same character, but in different circumstances, can mean something very different to our protagonist. But Acastus and the crew are successful in luring Talos to walk beside where Jason is, so Jason can then lever Talos's casting vent open. The life force is literally drained out of the giant, and as he falls, he crushes Hylas. With Talos defeated, the crew can now repair the ship. We are robbed of Hercules's rather poignant departure from the crew. It happens off panel, and we are just told that he refused to leave the island. Jason turns to Hera to ask her advice once more. He wants her help to restore the crew's faith in him, and she does so by telling him his next destination. He must go to Phrygia and seek out the blind man, Phineas. When she gives him this advice, she warns him that this is the last time she can help him. No, it isn't. There was the business by the river, her telling him where to find the fleece, two, her advice to head to the Isle of Bronze, three, We've just seen the fourth time, which was how to defeat Talos. 
And now this, that's five. Now I know they said five in the film, but in here they said six. Zeus said it and she said it, six times. Now she's only helped him five and she's pretending that's it, your six chances are up. And there was me thinking we'd get an extra dose of divine intervention. They will still get help though, from the blind man Phineas, once they've helped him deal with the harpies that plague him day in, day out. It's a nice illustration of the character here, but I don't think it really looks like the actor in the film, who was played by a pre-Doctor Who Patrick Troughton. It wasn't going to be the last time he worked with Ray Harryhausen either, because he reappeared in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. Jason and the crew help him trap the harpies so he can live in peace, and as a sign of his appreciation, he tells Jason where to find Colchis and gives him a charm. In the film, this charm, when it falls into the sea, grows into the massive form of Triton, who then holds apart the clashing rocks that would otherwise destroy the Argo. Not so here. They do head between the rocks, and indeed they are the clashing rocks. Boulders rain down on them, and we assume that the cliffs either side are moving closer, because again, Triton does appear and holds them apart. But there's no mention of the charm being dropped into the sea, they just say that the charm helped them. Actually, Jason even thinks that maybe Hera arranged another chance for them. She probably feels bad because she shortchanged them. Shortly after this, they find a survivor from one of the other wrecks, and this is Medea. She is from Colchis. She reaffirms the existence of the fleece, but she says that the king of Colchis would never give it up. Acastus says they should attack Colchis by night. Jason says this is a terrible idea. Not only that, but he is certain that he would end up with Acastus's javelin in his back. Apparently, this completely reasonable assumption cannot left unchallenged, and Acastus demands to have a duel with Jason, which Jason is happy to oblige. There is no clear winner as such, as Acastus dives overboard, and the crew just assume that he's dead. The odd thing is, this fight scene is in the film, but I have seen the film so many times and I had absolutely no recollection of it. I guess maybe because there were no monsters in that bit? The next day they arrive in Colchis and before the king, Jason claims he's there on a mission of peace. However, the king has already been informed of his true motivations and he was informed by Acastus. What a surprise, he wasn't dead. In fact, it was at this point in the film that Jason first discovers that Acastus is Pelias' son. Medea was right. The king will not give up the Golden Fleece, and he has Jason and his entire crew imprisoned. So it seems that Pelias' plan has worked out perfectly. Jason is locked up, and he, Pelias, is safe. But fate and Medea have other plans. Because that night, she descends into the dungeon to release Jason and his crew. Part of the reason that she does this is because she loves him. Of course she does. No one ever fancies each other in these things, do they? It's always instant love. And that's not all. Because Jason loves her too. Having drugged the guards, she doesn't just release the crew, but she leads them to the fleece. When the king finds out, he's furious. Although I do love his wah response. He quickly reasons that it must be Medea because he saw how she was looking at Jason. He also guesses that she must be leading him to the Golden Fleece. They must stop them. At the same time, Acastus is also heading for the Fleece in an attempt to claim the prize for he and his father. In fact, he gets to it first but it's not all good news for him, because as Jason and Medea arrive at the fleece, they also discover its guardian, a creature that has already come across Acastus. We then get a nice little battle between Jason and the Hydra, which of course isn't as much of a marvel as it was on the screen when Ray had to animate seven independent heads, but it's still good fun and rather dynamic. Our hero overcomes the beast, and Medea is on him in a flash, whilst the Hydra is still in its death throes. 
Back off, woman, you're suffocating me. Jason has killed the Hydra and he has the fleece, but it's not over yet because as he leaves with his prize, the king and his men arrive. And the king has a trick up his sleeve as he orders his men to retrieve some of the dead Hydra's teeth. We are told that Medea is hurt. Actually, she gets shot in the back with an arrow. Not that you'd know it from reading the comic. She says she can't go on anymore, but thanks to the fleece, she can. Well, that moment of peril didn't last long, did it? But when it comes to action, well, in just one page, we go from seeing the burning carcass of the Hydra to the king scattering its teeth on the ground. And we know what that means. The sight of a skeletal arm holding aloft a sword doesn't seem to put Jason and his friends off from having their conversation. But by the next panel, it is clear that we are going to witness what many have said is Ray Harryhausen's greatest achievement. And it is great a phenomenally well choreographed fight between seven skeletons, including by the way, a reused skeleton from the seventh voyage of Sinbad and Jason's crew. It is around five minutes of sheer fantastic delight. Here, it doesn't get as much attention as Talos did, lasting just two pages and six panels. Does it do it justice? It's difficult to replicate a film action scene on what is basically a static medium. But it's great to see. I'm not really sure what else they could have done. No sooner does Jason dive off the edge of the cliff, taking the undead army with him, than his colleagues haul him back onto the Argo. And it ends exactly the same way as the film. Jason and Medea kiss, and on Mount Olympus, Zeus points out that the game is not over. He says, let them enjoy this calm moment, but there will be other adventures. He hasn't finished with Jason yet. We will continue the game another day. Sequel, 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 see. There was no sequel, not on the silver screen anyway. In the 21st century, Blue Water Comics released not just one, but two comic book series that continued the tale. The first released in 2008, Jason and the Argonauts' Kingdom of Hades followed our heroes on the journey home. And then, in 2014, Jason and the Argonauts' final chorus wrung the final bit of blood from the stone. So why no cinematic follow-up? It is often thought that it was due to the film's lukewarm performance at the box office. However, Ray himself has said that he intentionally ended the film where he did, not to tease a sequel, but because in the original tale, Jason dumps Medea at the very next Greek beach that they get to. Medea, by the way, who was a witch. So to avoid the spoiling of a happy ending, it ended where it did, with Jason actually not fulfilling his destiny. Where the star of the film is concerned, Todd Armstrong did some TV and a few more movies, but nothing with the lasting legacy of J and the A's. I'm bored of saying it. Sadly, he died in 1992 after taking his own life. He was just 55 years old. Another actor of note from the film is Douglas Wilmer, who played evil King Pelias. He had a long and varied career, and just like Patrick Troughton, this was not his last Ray Harryhausen production, as he returned in the role of the Vizier in The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. There was a comic book adaptation of that film too, and yes, we will cover that in due course. But for the time being, Ray was going to leave behind the worlds of the Arabian Nights and ancient Greece and lend his magical touch to some more diverse periods of history.